Oh, good evening and welcome. You're watching Switch Focus. I'm Daniel Kariki. Our sign language and temperature this evening is Michael Maidia. Our starting point this evening is in Africa, to be specific, in Kenya. Now, the newly isolated Omicron variant has now overtaken the Delta variant as the predominant strain in the country. A genomic sequencing conducted by local laboratories on Friday last week found that all the samples tested were the new variant. Tests that had been conducted 10 days earlier had found 76% of the samples to be the Omicron variant, with the Delta variant accounting for 18% of the samples. Data from the African Union on Thursday shows that the Omicron variant of the coronavirus is spreading rapidly across the African continent. As of Thursday, 22 countries have reported the, pre the presence of the Omicron variant. Priority service givers, at least 30% of Kenyan's population will receive the COVID-19 jab. The cumulative total of confirmed COVID-19 cases in the United States has exceeded 51.8 million. The death toll now surpasses 813,000, according to the latest data released by the Center for Systems Science and Engineering at John Hopkins University. Daniela Nunda reports. At present, many hospitals in the United States are under severe pressure from the Omicron and Delta variants, with medical staff in a state of exhaustion. Data from the U.S. Health and Human Services shows that there were over 70,000 hospitalized cases of COVID-19 across the country as of Thursday. According to the New York Times, the average new daily number of hospitalized COVID-19 cases in the country exceeded 69,000 in the week ending Wednesday, an increase of 11% in two weeks. The District of Columbia saw the fastest increase of 64% followed by 58% in Connecticut, 56% in New Hampshire and 40% in New York State. The proportion of hospital beds occupied by COVID-19 patients across the country is currently as high as 87.1% and hospitals in most states are operating at full capacity. Hospitals in 22 states and territories across the United States are under stress, meaning facilities in those areas are unable to provide care to other patients. Many healthcare workers are in a state of exhaustion and even leaving the medical field as a result. The U.S. healthcare industry lost about 450,000 workers from February 2020 to November this year. The vast majority of them nurses and home care workers, according to the U.S. Labor Department. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio announced on Thursday that the city will scale back the Times Square New Year's Eve celebration as the Omicron variant spreads with as many as 15,000 people instead of the usual 58,000 to be allowed in designated viewing areas. In addition, all spectators participating in the celebration must wear masks and show proof of full vaccination and identification. The mayor's office said it could not rule out issuing new rules in the coming days due to the spread of the Omicron variant. Reporting for Switch TV, I'm Daniel Anunda. Now, thousands of Sudanese rallied on Thursday condemning sexual attacks after the United Nations said at least 13 women and girls were raped during the recent mass protest against the army. The United States and the European Union on Thursday issued a joint statement condemning the similar act. Britain, Canada, Norway and Switzerland were all signatories to the statement calling to Khartoum to carry out a full and independent investigation. The UN says it had received allegations of sexual harassment by security forces against women women who are trying to flee the area around the presidential palace in Khartoum on Sunday. According to the Independent Doctors Committee, two people died during protests on Sunday, making at least 47 to the number of people killed during clashes since the military power grab.
Moving on now, at least 37 people have been killed and about 100 others injured after a packed ferry caught fire in southern Bangladesh. The blaze of the three-decked vessel started mid-river near the town of Jalakathi at the sail from the capital Dhaka to the town of Barguna. Some of the big victims drowned after jumping into the water. The number of casualties is likely to increase as many of the passengers have severe burns. Initially, as many as 500 people were reportedly on the board of the vessel the fire is believed to have started in the engine room and quickly spread across the ferry. Now, now, TikTok tops charts after it outs Google to become favorite online destination. The viral video app gets more hits than American search engine, according to Cloudflare. The rankings show that TikTok knocked Google off the top spot in February, March and June this year and has held the number one position since August. Last year, Google was first and a number of sites including TikTok, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, now Meta, Microsoft and Netflix were all in the top 10. It is believed one of the reasons for the surge in TikTok's popularity is because of the COVID pandemic as lockdowns meant more people were stuck at home and looking for entertainment. Now, now, the man who led 2008 coup in Guinea and believed rule was marked by a stadium massacre returned to the West African country Wednesday after more than a decade in exile in Burkina Faso. Cameroon's man exile eventually paved the way for Guinea's first democratic election since independence from France, which put Alpha Conde in power. The man who led the 2008 coup in Guinea and whose brief rule was marked by a stadium massacre returned to the West African country on Wednesday after more than a decade in exile in Burkina Faso. Musa Dadis Kamaha left Guinea in December 2009 after narrowly surviving an assassination attempt carried out by one of his own bodyguards. Many in Conakry are happy for his return. Really, I'm delighted by his return after a decade in exile out of this country. I'm so happy. Kamara's exile eventually paved the way for Guinea's first democratic election since independence from France, which put Alpha Conde in power. In memory of the victims of these painful events, for the respect of the institutions of the Republic and for the integrity of history, I am fully committed, as I have always been, to tell my version of the truth in this matter of the 28th of September. And I'm ready to put myself at the disposal of the courts because nobody is above the law so that this kind of event will never again plunge Guinea into mourning. For years, the government had sought to prevent Camara's homecoming. Another military coup earlier this year put a military junta in power that was less obstructive to Camara's return. Over 21 million Americans have difficulties in gaining enough food as rising inflation and supply chain rises have aggravated the food shortage and pushed up the prices, according to official data censors. U.S. Census Bureau estimates that 21.1 million Americans didn't have enough to eat in early December. The number of households which sometimes or often don't have enough to eat reached 9.7 percent, a five-month high, according to the data collected between December 1st to 13th December. High inflation and food prices have made it much more difficult for low-income families to get fresh food. Data from the Department of Agriculture shows that the consumer price index in November rose to 6.8% from a year ago, while the food prices in November was 6.1% higher.
Now, Afghan refugees are continuing to make their way to the U.S. for months on from the Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan. But settling the new arrivals into their new home has not been easy. As more refugees continue to stream into the American towns and cities, organizations and volunteers have been striving to help them get off the best of possible. Start in the next country. Take a look. At the Metro Denver North Islamic Center, a non-profit humanitarian organization in North Glen, Colorado, people have been coming to drop off an assortment of items for their new neighbors from Afghanistan. Workers at the center say that the donations began soon after Afghans began fleeing their country in large numbers in August this year. Kind-hearted people have donated a whole host of necessities from clothing, cookware, to household items, and even a rug. But many children appear to have focused on one particular item of clothing, according to one local woman. Losing everything they have and coming brand new to a country they don't know and have nothing, literally nothing but each other. So, Some 1,100 new Afghan refugees, many of whom left virtually everything behind, have landed in Colorado already, with these new residents of America trying to get back on their feet. They're still on their way. They're coming more every every time we turn around. There's new families we're introduced to. Many of these refugees began their new lives in U.S. military bases, but finding a roof over their heads now that they have made it to Colorado has proved a real challenge. I feel like we are still on the base because we don't have much space to buy our own clothes or uh, items that we need for our life to start. Like many, Aymak and his family are currently staying in an hotel, while some others are in transitional housing, which has been set up in the Denver area. With the help of federal funding, a system has been established to provide a range of services to refugees, including offering advice on looking for employment. Umid Rawan left his entire family in Afghanistan and made it here in recent days. I'm trying, I'm struggling just to get my family as soon as possible here with myself. Yeah, it's really difficult to be away from your family. There's no job, there's no work for people in Afghanistan and they're facing like economic problems and also so these are all the challenges which really suffer me here. This has been a monumental task for all those involved in the resettlement effort. But the chance to help others is rewarding. None of us knew what we're getting into. I'm overwhelmed, but the feeling is good. You know, we are excited that we are able to hold somebody else's hand. With 900 more Afghan refugees expected in Colorado by the end of February, there are more challenges to overcome. But if all goes well, then a brighter future should lie ahead. New life, new opportunities, peaceful environment, great people around me. So that's much appreciated. Brian, Samba Switch TV. We take a short break. We'll be back with more. Stay tuned.
Now, here's some beauty. With dozens of volcanoes on its territory, many of which are still inactive, Nicaragua is dubbed as a land of volcanoes. The Ompiti Island, located in Nicaragua Lake in southwestern Nicaragua, is a popular tourist destination for its beautiful scenery and rich species diversity. The island has two volcanoes and covers 276 square kilometers. The island was added to the list of the UNESCO World Network of Biosphere Reserves in 2010. In it, is a garden on the island that provides a habitat for the butterflies. It was opened in 2014. Now there are nine species of butterflies in the garden. The Mazaya volcano is famous for its Santiago crater, which is very impressive at night, with lava tumbling and smoke spewing out from which the crater. It is the largest national park in Nicaragua, attracting countless visitors every year. Take a look. Now, Libya has voiced a mix of frustration and anxiety after elections set for Friday were postponed, which some have hoped would help turn the page of a new decade of violence. Following a formal ceasefire and a UN-led dialogue process, a transitional government was formed to lead the country to elections, but tensions between armed groups and institutions still remain. Chris Wambua reports. After the winter crest, the coldest period of the year is around the corner. Different species of migratory birds have flown to the northwest China autonomous region and Shenzhen city of the south China province for winter as a major habitat for global migratory birds to take a rest during their annual migration. The Manas National Wetland Park in Manas County serves as a fueling station for these birds to have a stopover every winter. The number of swans wintering here is increasing every year with improving ecological environment of the Westland Park. Recently, 300 more whooper swans landed in the Westland Park. Now, computer, commuter public buses have been operating, requiring passengers to and from Kigali to present vaccination certificates. As a new COVID-19 preventive guideline, one of the commuters at the taxi park says the reason as to why there is still a big number of Rwandans that have yet to be vaccinated is negative mentalities, mentalities towards vaccination rooted by religious beliefs, as Apollo James reports. Despite the commuters not being fully prepared for these guidelines, they are happy with the government's decisions and guidelines implemented. Rwanda Biomedical Council data on December 19th shows that over 7 million are vaccinated with the first dose, while about 5 million have two shots and 73,000 have received booster dose. One of the commuters at the taxi park says the reason as to why there is still a big number of Rwandans that haven't yet been vaccinated is negative mentalities towards vaccination rooted by religious beliefs. At the bus park of Kigali City, it seems that citizens of Rwanda do not have an issue with the mandates of vaccination when it comes to moving from one location to another. Besides the taxi parks, city malls, bars and restaurants are requiring citizens to prove that they have received both jobs. Apollo James, Switch Television. Now moving on, thousands of Zimbabweans lined up outside banks and currency exchange offices across the country on Thursday, some for days, in a desperate bid to get cash before the Christmas. More Zimbabwe, Zimbabweans say they will ignore the customary countryside visits for Christmas because of the biting economic crisis and aligned by cash shortages, Mariam Jahid reports. 
Long winding queues have become a common feature in the Harare Central Business District as citizen mainly civil servants try to withdraw their salaries. In many instances, people spend whole nights in queues to maximize their chances of accessing the cash. A survey by Nizibambwe.com on Thursday showed that many of the bureaucrats the change had no money while only one was said to have picked only 200 people to get money on that day. Over 1,000 people were crowded at Karigamombe Centre which accommodates three forex exchange facilities. Some claimed that they had been queuing since last Thursday with no luck. Men and women and babies sleep in queues without any ablution facilities and in violation of COVID-19 regulations. Some citizens feel the facilities are giving money to those who operate in black market. Burex the change started selling foreign currency to ordinary work-in customers as per the resolutions of Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe Monetary Policy Committee meeting in August this year. This was done to promote financial inclusion and access to forex for small value transactions. But this facility, which provides foreign currency to general citizens at a generous rate, is being overwhelmed by clients seeking to benefit. In terms of the MPC resolutions, members of the public can buy the forex from Burex the change at the official RBZ ruling auction exchange rate at $120 this week plus a commission of just 10% which is significantly lower price than the black market rate of around $230 to the greenback. Reporting for Switch, my name is Mariam Njahid. China offered 1 million U.S. dollars in cash donations and another 4,725 tons of rice on to help the victims of Typhoon Rai in Philippines. Chinese ambassador to the Philippines, Huang Xing, announced their assistance on a handover ceremony, bringing China's total donations to 10,000 tons of rice. Take a look. The destructive power of the typhoon was the main cause of the casualties, and this was noted by the official situation is very bad because uh, the entire province was affected by the super typhoon. The entire province uh, was inside the typhoon. And the typhoon is uh, very, very strong. 200 uh, kilometers per hour winds and um, uh, gustiness of up to 250 kilometers. So the destruction was very great. No. Uh, actually, um, it, it shows that the force evacuation uh, actually worked to save many lives. At the present, Bau province's communication system is still partially interrupted. In addition, the people in the affected areas are in urgent need of food and water, as well as generators and fuel to restore power and water supplies. Uh, immediate assistance that we're giving is food and water at this point in time. And uh, we need boom trucks so we can move the fallen trees and the fallen concrete posts from the national highways so it will not clog the streets. The Chinese ambassador to the Philippines, Huang Xilian, has stated that in order to help the Philippine government and the people battle the disaster, the Chinese embassy in the Philippines urgently had gathered food packages including rice, canned food and other instant noodles. The relief supplies are being shipped to the disaster hit areas including Boho and Cebu. Uh, on behalf of the uh, Philippine provinces that are affected, and on behalf of Bohol, if we will get a share of that, we would like to thank the Chinese people and the People's Republic of China for the assistance. The typhoon first slammed into Siagao Island off the eastern coast of Mindanao Island in the southern Philippines on December 16th. The Rai has lashed the Philippines for three days, causing floods and landslides and leaving trail of destruction in the central and southern Philippines region, including some areas in the main island of Luzon. Robatoma, Switch TV News. Moving on now, a leading Hong Kong university has dismantled and removed a statue from its campus site that for more than two decades has commemorated pro-democracy protesters killed during China's Tiananmen Square crackdown in 1989. The artwork of anguished human torsos is one of the few remaining public memorials in the former British colony to remember the bloody crackdown that is a taboo topic in mainland China, where it cannot be publicly commemorated. Known as the Pillar of Shame, the statue 
issue was a key symbol of the wide-ranging freedoms promised to Hong Kong at its 1997 return to the Chinese rule. California will require healthcare workers and workers in high-risk con con congregate settings to get a COVID-19 vaccine booster by February 1st. Governor Gavin Newsom affirming that this is part of the state state's response to the highly transmiss transmissible Omicron variant. State employees who will still not receive the booster must undergo testing for COVID-19 twice each week before the Feb 1 deadline. Workers have been allowed to request exemptions for religious and medical reasons. Take a look. Recognize now that just being vaccinated, fully vaccinated, is not enough. California Governor Gavin Newsom on Wednesday announced that his state will require health care workers and workers in high-risk congregate settings to get a COVID-19 vaccine booster by the 1st of February. This mandate follows one earlier this year that required state health care workers to be fully vaccinated, although some have been able to request an exemption for religious or medical reasons. Now, Newsom says the booster is just as necessary. It is increasingly clear, though it's not formalized, and we are not at this stage formalizing it in the state of California, that the full dosing is a third dose. And that's why the booster is so important, and we're here to promote our boosting efforts here in the state of California. State employees who still have not received a booster must undergo testing for COVID-19 twice each week until the mandate goes into effect. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, California exceeds the average for full vaccinations with over 65 percent, but slightly lags behind in booster shots at just under 30 percent. Newsom also announced that all public school students from kindergarten to 12th grade will receive a rapid COVID-19 test as they head back to school from winter break. Thank you for your company. Do enjoy the rest of your viewing. Good evening. Asante.